for being here today, and those of you watching, thanks for worshiping with us on a holiday weekend, and uh, we welcome you here. Everybody stand if you would. You can see things are a little different this morning. We have the most amazing praise and worship band and singers in the world, in our opinion. Don't you think so? Amen. <laughs> And they're not here today. We're giving them a well-deserved break from uh, the platform. And uh, Lawrence Tuning, who's a treasure not only to us here, but to the world through his ministry and preaching, teaching, and uh, music. Uh, he's going to lead us in some uh, wonderful hymns this morning. How many of you grew up with hymns and you miss it every now and then? Well, we're in store for a treat Let's pray. Father, thank you for your blessing on our life. Thank you for the opportunity to get together like this and to worship you on the Lord's day. And we pray that you would move in to our midst in a fresh way today and relieve heavy burdens that may be here. And so we honor you and we worship you in song now. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome Lawrence Tuning as he leads us. You know, I just told Carl a minute ago that I remember the day when singing contemporary was uh, doing things outside the box. Nowadays, to do a hymn is really sort of a rare thing. But I love the hymns. I love the new and the old. But as a songwriter, my heart goes out to these people who sat down and wrote these songs. So let's, uh, let's do a few songs that we grew up with. Sing it. We often forfeit. 
peace and joy. seated you can if you want to keep standing you can I don't know if you know this song or not but I love this song Lord plant my feet on higher ground our brother Charlie is on that higher ground right now Pressing on, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm climbing every day, still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord plant my feet on high ground. Some may dwell where these abound. My prayer, my aim is higher ground. Amen. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My faith on heaven's table land. A higher claim than I have found. Darts that be our home, for faith has called the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up where I let me stand. Lord, lift me up and let 
Amen. Fanny Crosby wrote this next one, and many times it's been used as an altar call song. But I, I love it. Just I just want Jesus to stop this way whenever he's passing by. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We invite you here today, Lord. on my mind this will be the last one we do before Carl comes <clears throat> the love of God is greater far we have the words here you can sing it with me the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave His Son to win His erring child. He reconciled and pardoned from His sin. You know, about 200 years ago, there was a notorious prison. And... Uh, they vacated the prison, I think, went to another prison and brought in painters to paint the walls. 
One of the painters saw scrawled on the wall a poem that a prisoner had written. We don't know if he wrote it himself or, or had read it somewhere, but wonderful, wonderful verse, which is the second verse of this song. And that painter had the good sense to write it down before he painted over it. And when the writer of this song found it, the, word, the, the meter fit exactly with what he had written. Think of what this prisoner wrote. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade. from sky to sky Oh love of God how rich and pure how measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saint and angel song one last time Lord, Lord. Love this morning. Amen. Thank you, Lawrence. We appreciate the gift of God in you. You're a treasure to the world and a treasure to us first. I do want to uh, give you an update on some of our church family. Um, we have several this past week who have tested positive for COVID. Aren't you tired of saying that word? I won't call many names because I would leave some out. Some who usually are on our praise team or at home in quarantine with mild to moderate symptoms, and uh, uh, our prayers are with them. I've said it for a year and a half. We are praying one for another more than we ever have. And I do want to call two names because these are members of our church family who are in the hospital, both in intensive care and both are there dealing with COVID and pneumonia. But uh, uh, Randy and Katie Haynes' granddaughter, Britton, has been in ICU all week. She's only 14 dealing with COVID. But the news gets better every day. Even this morning, the doctors are pleased. Her lungs are improving. They've been able to turn her oxygen supply down. So she's headed in the right direction. And continue to pray for this precious girl, Britton, and for all of the Haynes family. And then the other member of our church that's in serious condition, in the hospital, in ICU, and has been on a vent all week completely sedated, is Daryl Canteen, Reggie and Carla's son, their oldest son. He's 29 years old. He grew up in this church. He and his family would worship right over here in this section. Daryl is a precious young man, and uh, he's uh, struggling, and uh, we need to continue to pray for him and for all of uh, the canteen family. It's been going around in their home, but he's the only one uh, in serious condition and in ICU this morning. Now, I'm tired of talking about COVID because there is a name that's higher than COVID, and his name is? Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, Lord. I do want to mention before we get into the word 
this morning three announcements. First is this afternoon at 1 o'clock, between 1 and 2 o'clock, the Charles Rawlinson family will receive friends here in the sanctuary. And then at 2 o'clock this afternoon, the celebration of life service for our friend and our brother, Charles Rawlinson. He passed away this past week at age 71, and uh, God, we all loved this man. If you knew Charlie, you loved Charlie. And most recently, he would sit back here, and, and he would be here in the auditorium, but playing his... Uh, uh, the live stream feed on his phone out loud. And, uh, so he was uh, quite a blessing, not only here, but especially in Nicaragua, the work that he did there in world missions. Our prayers today are with Brenda, his wife, and all of their family. And we're going to dismiss service early. In fact, I have a 15-minute word, maybe 20 it depends on how much fun I'm having. But do, we do want to be sensitive to your schedule, and we do encourage you uh, after service this morning, uh, go home, get you a little rest and something to eat, and I hope you will be back this afternoon for uh, the celebration of life service for our brother Charlie. And if you're not able to make it, uh, it will be live streamed on our church Facebook page. Uh, and uh, I understand... Uh, our missionaries in Nicaragua, Brian and Millie Hudson, are hosting a live stream gathering there because so many people in Nicaragua knew Charlie and loved him. And so uh, it will be aired and viewed in at least two nations. That's this afternoon visitation at one and then the service at two. I do want to mention two more announcements briefly. One is next Saturday. Here at the church, it will all be outdoors, uh, but uh, there will be a health fair here. It will start at 9 in the morning and last until noon. It's sponsored by Miss Pat Quillen and her ministry, Caring Hearts of the PD. And we hope that you will take advantage of that. You can come by and get your cholesterol checked. They're doing diabetes check. You'll be able to talk with uh, uh, some nurses and doctors, uh, your blood pressure, uh, it will just be, we're doing this as a community outreach. It was in Miss Pat, uh, Pat Quillen's heart to do this as a service to our community and a great way to get people who don't go to church anywhere uh, to uh, come to our church campus next Saturday. Uh, so uh, be mindful of that and come take advantage of it. And then finally, we have uh, a very special Sunday next Sunday. This week, our church celebrates 35 years of the goodness of God. And over the years, these many years, uh, we have been able to uh, make a difference, not only in our city, but in many nations of the world. And uh, our guest speaker next Sunday will be Philip Miles. He is the son of our bishop, Houston Miles. Philip has been here several times before over the years. He will be here to celebrate this milestone with us and to bring us a good word moving forward as we begin our next 35 years. That sounds good, doesn't it? So I hope you'll be here to celebrate a special day with us at Abundant Life next Sunday at 10. Well, I will be brief with the word, but that doesn't minimize the importance of this word. This is an issue that every believer deals with. I want to Start by asking you a loaded question. Is there someone in your life, past or present, that you need to forgive? Another question, and both questions have the same answer. Do you need God to forgive you? We've all been there. The answer for each of us on both of those questions is yes, we have had to forgive those who've offended us and wounded us. Some by intention, other, uh, others that had no idea what they said or what they did. 
left a scar on our life. But yes, we must practice forgiveness. I want to share a story with you that Jesus told. It's in the 18th chapter of Matthew, and I'll just read part of the story, and then we'll look closely at a couple of verses in just a minute. But Jesus is speaking these words, and he said, Therefore the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars, and he couldn't pay up. So his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife and his children and everything he owned so that he could pay off the massive debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, Please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave him his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded immediate payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged him for a little more time to pay these few dollars back. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until that debt of a few dollars could be paid in full. And when some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. And they went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. Jesus said, that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. The king had been merciful. And we know the Bible teaches both. It teaches mercy and it teaches judgment. But the Bible says that mercy rejoices over judgment. The Bible says mercy triumphs over judgment. And this king had been merciful to forgive an enormous debt that could never have been paid back. And then when this person had received such a huge amount of forgiveness, he would not even give a little mercy to someone who owed him a very little bit of money. And God dealt harshly with this unforgiving servant. Now, you have the ability to be merciful and we also have the ability to be judgmental. And if we want God to forgive us of our sins, he will only do that as we forgive others who've sinned against us. How high and mighty we all are at times if we're not careful to forget the enormous amount of forgiveness God has given us when it comes time that we should extend a little mercy and a little forgiveness to those who've offended us. But it works hand in hand. If there's anybody in your life, past or present, you need to forgive, then realize the bigger picture is you need God to forgive you. And our action holds the key in many cases 
for God to extend his goodness to us. In Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 14, Jesus preached this in the Sermon on the Mountain. He said, if, if, that's a big word right here, if, Jesus said this, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. And then the next verse he said, but if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. You know, that's in the Bible. Uh, that's in the Bible. And I believe once you get saved and born again, uh, you know, you've got your ticket to heaven. I grew up believing uh, I could backslide every hour, and I think I did for a lot. Of those hours, I would get saved every week, usually on Sunday night at the Pentecostal church where our family attended. And I remember one Monday morning after I had gotten saved the night before, forgiven of my sin, it felt so good. I slept so well that night. But Monday morning at the bus stop, before the bus picked me up for school, I backslid. <laughs> uh, I... I did believe back then in eternal insecurity. I didn't think you could ever be sure, but I've learned a lot. God is a, a God of grace and mercy toward all of us. And uh, I believe if you ever know the Lord, if you ever accept him, then your destination is heaven. Uh, but how much easier it would be in this life if we understood that God continually forgives us of sin as we forgive others of their sins against us. If we refuse to forgive others, Jesus said, your father will not forgive you. And unforgiveness prevents God from forgiving our own sins. Now, that's harsh. I don't know how it's all going to wash out on judgment day when we stand before him. Not my job, not my business. That's his. But we don't want any hindrance to God forgiving us, and we have full authority to be sure he's released and free to forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. In the Lord's Prayer, he teaches us to pray this way, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And if we refuse to forgive others, we are sentencing our own self. And we're branding our own self unforgiven. Now, there's a better way to live life. Uh, unforgiveness is a form of hate against another person. Unforgiveness is the sin that John Bevere calls the bait of Satan. And why would Satan want us to have this revelation of practicing forgiveness? Because the longer he can keep us in unforgiveness toward those who've hurt us, then the bitterer our soul becomes. It's like poison. Now, there are three trademarks of unforgiveness. If you're dealing with unforgiveness. And haven't we all, maybe some might be dealing with it today. Maybe someone has hurt or wounded you by something they said or did even this past week. This will be able to tell you immediately whether you're dealing with unresolved issues and you have not released and forgiven someone who has hurt you in the past. Three words. The first is revenge. Do you feel it stirring? Revenge says, I'm going to get even. I've been there. I've been done wrong by a few people in my life. And uh, uh, I've gone through the process. Oh, I have, uh, I have plotted revenge. <laughs> Revenge, if you're dealing with any of that, that could be a sign you've not yet fully forgiven someone who's hurt you in your past. And let's remember that when it comes to 
revenge and vengeance. God said, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Can't we trust him to settle that score for us? And then the second word is resentment. And resentment says, I'm going to stay angry. I've been there. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't ready to let it go yet. Uh, I wanted to stew over it for a while longer. I just didn't think the person deserved my forgiveness yet, not just yet. And so I would just let it stir. And, and, and all the while, it wasn't hurting the person who hurt me. It was eating me alive on the inside. Revenge, I'm going to get even. And resentment, I'm going to stay angry at that person. And then the third word is remembering. Remembering says, I will never forget about it. Unforgiveness is like me drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Doesn't hurt that other person. They may be clueless. They may not even know they wounded you. They're living their life. So your revenge and your resentment and your remembering and refusing to let it go is not hurting them a bit, but it's killing you on the inside. Let's look at a few other scriptures quickly. Uh, in Matthew 18, verse 21, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Now, that's a lot right there. Lawrence, if you were to offend me today, oh, I love you so much I'd forgive you. But if you offended me the second time, I'd take an hour maybe. And the third time today, the fourth and the fifth. But Lawrence, if you offended me seven times today and I forgave you seven times, I would be pleased with myself. I have forgiven someone who offended me. And Lawrence, you never have. You make the perfect model for this because you never have <laughs> offended me. Uh, but if I had to forgive the same person seven times in one day, I would think, well, that's enough. Peter said, Jesus, how many times should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Jesus answered and said, no, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Now that 70 times seven is a phrase in the language uh, that was spoken in the day of Jesus. It was a phrase, uh, and it literally means there's no limit to the number. It was just a colloquial expression of their day and their culture. He did not literally mean 490 times and then stop. He meant there is no end to uh, the amount of forgiveness that's expected out of us when somebody offends us. And Jesus said it again in Luke chapter 6 and in verse 27. He said, but to you who are willing to listen. There you go. Not everybody's willing. But Jesus said to those of you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. The next verse says, bless those who curse you and pray for those who hurt you. Jesus said that. Sort of hard to do, isn't it? I remember one time, and I'm not special. I'm no more special than any of you. We all have our stories. I remember one time, though, many years ago, somebody uh, said something um, that hurt me. Uh, his intention, apparently, was to hurt me. And uh, I carried that thing for months. I mean, you talk about revenge. I wanted to get even. Uh, and I would get in my car and drive by myself, and, and I, I, was, I was red in the face, screaming at the top of my voice, pretending he was in the car right there listening to everything I said. I felt so good when I got finished with my venting sessions. And 
It just wouldn't go away. This lasted weeks, maybe a few months, and I remember when it changed. I was in my car by myself and rehearsing it again. I was getting ready to open my mouth and out loud with nobody in the car but me go through my spiel again. And something changed on the inside of me, and I, instead of lashing out at a speech that was by now at least 30 minutes long and well rehearsed, I stopped myself, and I was able to say in prayer, Father, forgive him, and I pray that you would use him in the kingdom of God in a great way. Well, I've never revisited that. It's barely a memory now. Jesus said, pray for those who hurt you. That's when your healing comes. If anybody's offended you and you've not forgiven them yet, the best way to do it is this hour, today. Pray for those who've hurt you. That'll go a long way. And refusing to forgive someone will hinder God from answering your prayers. In Mark eleven twenty four, 24, it's real good news. We love it. Jesus said, I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. Now, what a blanket promise right there. It seems like the sky's the limit. There is no ceiling and the potential there. You can pray for anything, Jesus said. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. Isn't that a good word? Say amen, somebody. But the very next verse, Jesus said, but when you are praying, first, forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. I'm about to close, but I want to drive this point home. What about forgiveness for the repeat offender? For the person who never seems to change and continually attacks you and offends you and attempts to wound you repeatedly. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5, Paul said, I am not overstating it when I say that the man who caused all the trouble hurt all of you more than he hurt me. And then Paul said, most of you opposed him, and that was punishment enough. Most of you, he's writing to the church, and there had been a troublemaker in the church a troublemaker in the church, which, by the way, we don't have any. (laughs) Maybe this is preventative, I don't know, but thank God for peace and love and unity and forgiveness in the church. Amen. 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 But he said, most of you opposed him, and that was punishment enough. Now, however, it is time to forgive him and comfort him. Otherwise, he may be overcome by discouragement. Paul said, so I urge you now to reaffirm your love for him. Paul talking about a a man in the church at Corinth that had caused trouble in the church, and that church faced its share of challenges, as you know well. And Paul writes to that church dealing with unforgiveness about a brother who's a troublemaker. had caused problems for him, and he said... The man who caused trouble, I'm aware, has hurt all of you more than he hurt me. And then he said this, most of you opposed him, and that was punishment enough. Paul was saying to the church, he suffered enough. You've punished him enough. I recognize he caused you trouble. He caused you trouble more than he caused me, Paul said. But enough already. You've already opposed him, and that was punishment enough. Now it is time to forgive him and comfort him so that he won't become discouraged. I'm closing with this. 
Jesus set the standard high when it comes to forgiveness. And I ask you this question, how long have you held on to the grudge, uh, to the wound, to the unforgiveness? And how quickly did Jesus forgive? Consider that. How, how quick was Jesus to forgive? I'll tell you how quick. He said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And he said that while they were still killing him. That's how quickly Jesus forgives. And that's how quickly we should forgive those who've trespassed or sinned against us. It's been long enough. It's time to let it go. Would you stand with me, please? Everybody stand, bow your heads. Every head bowed, please. Thank you for a great crowd being here today, even on a holiday weekend. Every head bowed. Just want to ask. It begins here with this question. Well, nobody's looking but God and me. Raise your hand just quickly, just for a second. If you're dealing with unforgiveness in your life and this word is something you receive and you're going to go to work with this word, you're going to apply this word, immediately today. Raise your hand if that's you. Somebody's hurt you. So many hands. Of course, it's the story for all of us. Jesus said, it is impossible to live in this world without being offended. Father, I thank you for the revelation of your word. You say to us that we shall know the truth and the truth shall make us free. So, Jesus is the truth, the Word of God, the truth we need to live by. So I pray for the Holy Spirit now to do what I cannot and what no man or no woman can do, and that is turn our hearts toward forgiveness. Lord, we speak release to those who have hurt us, those who've spoken against us, those who've committed a deed, an act against us. And we say, Lord, we're aware we need forgiveness of our own sin. And, and if you require that we let another offense go and call that forgiven in order for you to keep us forgiven, then that's a small price to pay. Because each of us owes you a much larger debt, a sin debt, than anyone might owe us. And the enormity of the debt of our own sin, and yet you have canceled that debt against us. You've paid that debt. You've released us from that debt. And so we take a moment now to intentionally turn the page and to release anyone who has offended us or sinned against us. And I thank you that as we do this, we will have a fresh awareness of our own forgiveness and that healing, even physical healings in our body will come because we have been obedient to your word on this most important issue. We forget about it today. We realize enough is enough. And everyone said, amen. God bless you for being here today. We release you early. Go home, get a bite to eat, and uh, I hope to see you back at 1 o'clock for uh, visitation for uh, Charles Rawlinson's Celebration of Life.